All right. So we are in challenging times and we are hoping to bring you some virtual programs going forward. Greg Marley will be kicking off the series tonight. I'm Shane Billings, the program coordinator for Rockland Library, and I'm joined by our deputy director, Patty King. I would like to thank our director, Amy Levine, for making the Zoom meeting possible, and as always, our wonderful friends of the Rockland Public Library for their support of our programming. We are going to have a Q&A session at the end of Greg's talk. I encourage you to use the chat box, and if you want to enter questions throughout, Greg may or may not answer them during the talk. He will get to them at the end during the Q&A. And there is a raise hand feature on Zoom. If you wish to use that, Patty and I will try to um, watch for those at the end of the talk so we can unmute you to ask a question. But if that doesn't work, just stick to the chat box. Next week, we hope you'll join us on Tuesday, May 5th. Patty will be, um, has organized a trivia, main trivia, How Main Are You? That will be next Tuesday at 6.30. So please watch our Facebook page and you can email pking at rocklandmain.gov for a Zoom link to the trivia night. And on Thursday, May 21st, we will be having a Zoom concert with the duo New Shades of Blue. We're very excited for that as well. So Greg Marley has been collecting, studying, eating, growing, and <clears throat> talking about mushrooms for over 45 years, among many other things that he does. As a volunteer mushroom identification consultant, to poison control centers across New England, Greg provides expertise in mushroom po poisoning cases. He lives and mushrooms with his family right in Midcoast, Maine. And we are so fortunate to have him tonight. So I'm going to hand things over to Greg Marley for his talk. Thank you. All right, um, before I dive right in, um, I just wanna make sure that we acknowledge um, all of the people who are living in COVID social isolation. And as we begin to make up our lives in a different flavor, in a different way, where we're not seeing our friends as regularly, where you suddenly wish you could go into the office. Isn't that a strange feature, huh? This is what I'm hearing. And so one of the things I do is I mushroom. And so I started turning some attention to mushrooming. Um, and I'm really pleased that uh, this series of my talking about mushrooms online started with uh, Camden Library, and I'll, I'll let the Rockland people cover their ears, um, because we were, I was supposed to do a face-to-face -face talk there a few weeks ago, and, and suddenly that wasn't possible. And so we began to think, how can we do this online? How can we do this virtually? And off we go. So I'm gonna share my screen and start into this. And as a reminder, just like Shane said, um, feel free to type questions or comments into the chat box. I may or may not pick those up as I go along, but we'll have a time at the end for some questions. Um, so here we go. And uh, Make sure. All right, so that should do it. Everybody seeing um, the presentation, I hope. So we're really going to talk about, you know, um, wild mushrooms today. And I would acknowledge that um, my friends at the Maine Mycological Association are kind of co-sponsoring this series. Uh, I'm a director there, and we are a bunch of passionate mushroom people across the state of Maine who get together and help teach each other and new people, um, offering forays across the state when we can do it without socially isolating, that is. Um, so we look forward to maybe doing that later in the summer. We'll see. Um, so we're going to talk about that. And what we're going to cover today, I'm going to start out because for me, mushrooms are about magic. And it's about being in nature and enjoying that part of nature. So we're going to start there and then move into some of the cultural attitudes that shape our attitudes and our uh, feelings around mushrooms and whether or not we use them. And then go on to really review some beautiful uh, spring and early summer mushrooms, most of them edible and a few that are not. 
and then save some time for questions. So I want to start here that we live in Maine. Um, and I, I've been here, I'm not from Maine, I'm from away, I've been here for about 41 years. Um, but I stay here because of this place. The physical environment, the cultural and social environment, the breed of people we have here. And in terms of mushrooming, um, you know, this cool, moist climate that we mostly love other than these extended pseudo springs. Um, and we've got incredible square miles upon miles of diverse, abundant forest land. Um, and depending on where you are in the state, if you're along the coast, particularly north, um, you get this scrubby boreal um, coniferous forest and inland and toward the mountains, you get much more wonderful deciduous forests. And each of them will attract their own mushroom flora. And that's all around. And even though we can't get within six or 10 feet of each other, depends on who you ask, we can still get out in the woods. And our open forest is perfect for social distancing, staying healthy, walking meditation, staying in shape, um, it's wonderful. And so the other thing that's about Maine, we are a people that thrive on self-sufficiency. We grow our own food, we collect our own food, and you know we're a bunch of people that are self-sufficient with baskets in terms of mushrooming and at the end of that day you might get a basket or a bowl of king bolites that uh, will hold you for years so but first and foremost as i mentioned mushrooms have always pulled me into nature even before i came to maine and lived in the desert of new mexico as a kid I would go out in the in the forest and, and in the in the uh, mesas and the desert to get away to get away from family craziness and stress and to be with nature. So they brought beauty, they brought color, they bring magic into my life and they always have. And I continue to use mushrooms as an excuse, as in a way to get into nature because that's where I find my soul. That's where I come back into myself, there and in the garden and with people I love. So, and along that way, there is just this incredible beauty. This array of a, of a little Amanita called Amanita jacksonii, um, I found these in, um, in Augusta, within about a mile of where my office was at the time, walking through there, and you see these little clusters of thick, white, leathery, egg-like creatures in the forest floor with these bright orange mushrooms popping out of the top. And Amanita as a genus is the most dangerous group of mushrooms in the world. Um, these are ones where some people eat them. If I'm eating Amanitas, this is the only one I would eat. And if you find them in a young stage, you might think, is this a puffball? And if you cut these open lengthwise, there is no question because that outline of orange scarlet shows you the cap, the stem, the edges of the gills. It's just a Beautiful, beautiful picture there. Um, so that's the American Caesar's mushroom, so named because the variety of it, very similar that grows in Europe, was favored by the Roman Caesars. They would let people eat other mushrooms and they would keep those for the royalty, for the nobility. Ugh, we still do that mostly based on price these days. But if you can collect them yourself, you can bypass that money chain. Um, and then, you know, even from the large and the colorful to the small and the innocuous, you can see my thumb in this picture holding an acorn with this tiny mushroom erupting from it. And the mushroom is using the acorn as food. It's, it's breaking it down. Um, and this is called the garlic marasmius. And it's called garlic because if you squeeze that cap, you get this whoosh of kind of a mixture of garlic and truffle oil. Um, and some very fine restaurants and some very fine cooks use these to flavor their appetizers, the garlic marasmias. And then from the small to the truly tiny, I was up outside of Ellsworth in a forest that I deeply love one spring. Um, I had a very stressful period at work and I was just getting away for a day and walking in the woods and I found this pile of deer dung and I started, I saw these little dots on it. I picked it up and those tiny little mushroom buds, Coprinellus, um, are fruiting from this one little 
um, uh, bud of a, of a deer poop, um, just tiny and beautiful. Not necessarily considered edible, but you can think about that. Um, and then from the tiny to the just gorgeous. This is a, an example of an incredibly valuable um, and well-regarded medicinal mushroom called reishi or ling shi. Uh, our English name is the hemlock varnish conch because of that gorgeous color on the top. And this was a rainy day where the, it was just polished by the, by the moisture on it and created a beautiful picture, uh, fruiting on a hemlock log standing. And then I want to talk about these for a minute. Talk about magic and beauty. Um, sometimes in the, from late summer through the fall, you can find these big clusters of bright orange mushrooms, usually around the base of an oak tree. They're colorful. They're sometimes people confuse them for chanterelles with tragic mistakes. Um, but you can see them and the underneath is what makes them look a little like chanterelles. They're called jack-o'-lantern in part because of that bright orange pumpkin color and in part because if you get them in a very dark room when they're quite fresh and you take a time-lapse photograph of them, they glow. They literally glow in the dark with bioluminescence. Talk about a magic to share with kids of any age. Um, I took these photographs about nine o'clock at night in my office and it took me a while to get the right time lapse. But from here to here, it's just, it's, it's stunning. Um, just don't eat them because they're quite toxic. So let's move on from there to color. Um, there are a few things in nature that have the vivid array of colors um, that are shown in mushrooms. You'll see them in the ocean, you'll see them in insects, um, but then mushrooms, every color imaginable, including this beautiful, brilliant electric, electric blue. This is called the indigo milk cap. Um, and it's a mushroom, we don't find it very much here in the, in the, in the mid coast area, but if you get inland, particularly in, in uh, uh, pine forest in the late summer, you'll, or in, in the fall, you'll find them. Um, and it, you cut them and they're this incredible blue inside and they're edible. And when you cook them, they turn from blue to green. So you can have them with your green eggs and ham. Quite magical. Um, and then some of the Quartinarius, uh, incredible colors. This uh, bright violet blue and the bright red, the, the bloody red Quartinarius and the violet. Just stunning. So let's go from there and let's talk about mushrooms and where our attitudes begin to shift. And as soon as you think about using wild mushrooms for food, that's when you hear your parental voices in your ear from childhood that talk to you about the stories we learned growing up about wild mushrooms. Because America has been, for a long time, the land of fearing mushrooms, the mycophobic land, where we look at a wild mushroom and we say, must be a toadstool. Um, this little Amanita, um, probably Frostiana, that this toad posed beside for me, is a group, again, in that really toxic Amanitas and a classic toadstool. Um, and that's what we learned. Because, you know, for a long time in this country, after the advent of industrial food, we began to really fear wild mushrooms. We got further away from our connection with the land, even though probably most people um, who are watching this have those European roots where two generations, four generations, six generations ago, people were using mushrooms as a seasonal, sustainably collected food. Um, and that melting pot of pressure here in this country, we let go of those traditional foods and we learn to fear them. So pretty soon, mushrooms meant, you know, the supermarket mushroom. In fact, in my family growing up, I had the classic 1950s Irish American father. And the only mushrooms we had were when my mother snuck them into the tuna noodle casserole with the cream of mushroom soup and didn't tell my father that there were mushrooms there. Now, it's funny because my mother is French and German. And she recalls growing up on the ranch in Montana as a kid and collecting wild mushrooms with her mother and her sister. She never told me that when I started collecting them. It took a few years later she acknowledged that once she began to trust what I did. So 
there's other parts of the world where mushrooms are loved, um, but here, what did we learn growing up? Don't touch it, it's poisonous. And if it's poisonous, it's gonna kill you. So go wash your hands. It's that idea that mushrooms are better kicked than picked. Um, in fact, still today, um, garden centers will get calls from people who say, can you sell me something to get rid of all the mushrooms in my yard? And they, they probably could, but it would do really damage to all the plants as well, because the plants and the trees in your yard rely on their relationships with mushrooms for their health. So in other parts of the world, un, unlike the mycophobic, um, they are mycophilic. And mycophobic means mushroom fearing, mycophilic means loving. And in those countries, in Eastern Europe, Scandinavia, um, Slavic countries, uh, Spain, French, uh, France, um, um, Italy, parts of Germany and Austria, you know, all across uh, Japan and China, even the highlands of Mexico, mushrooms are loved and people learn about them and collect them as children. They learn their names with their numbers and their ABCs. And mushrooming is a multi-generational family activity. You can still see, you know, in the cities of, of uh, the former Soviet Socialist Republic, they'll empty out in the fall as the families go into the, into the forest to collect mushrooms. And there, knowledge is often much more informally held um, by family members with some age and experience, often women, and they pass that down to the family. Um, and in a mycophilic land, we have very different messaging. So I have some, uh, um, some quotes here. The one I love the best is from Valentina Pavlona Wasson, who, uh, emigrated here as a young woman and became a doctor. And then she married one of those Irish mycophobic wasps, Gordon Wasp. And um, they had this cultural sh shift where they understood the differences with each other and explored that for the rest of their lives. And this quote from her, she said, when we were naughty, our mother would punish us by forbidding us to go mushrooming. Can you imagine your mother saying that when you were growing up? Certainly my wouldn't. And from a Japanese um, haiku, my voice becomes the wind, mushroom hunting. And that kind of evokes that sense of peace that's there. And from Pishvin, the author, he said, you know, the fallen leaves were smelling like spice cakes and the white mushrooms are uncommon. And by white mushrooms, Bellier Grib, he's talking about the Bolita sedulous. Um, he says, but if you find them, you pounce on them like a black kite, cut them off. And remember that you promised yourselves not to cut them off right away, but to admire them first. Again, I promised myself. Again, I forgot. So that's a different world. So think about what are the messages you learned about mushrooms and how are they shaping and changing today? Because we're a country that is embracing mushrooms. Um, and this is a time during this COVID crisis when people are growing much more food, they're turning to the woods to see what they can gather and use, and their eyes are turning on mushrooms. So that's how we feel about mushrooms, but let's think about it. How do the mushrooms feel about us? Some of them are toxic. Some of them are even, you know, seriously toxic and can cause death. So a few of them are hallucinogenic. And so would you say that mushrooms are anthrophobic? They fear men? This is an album cover from a, a band called The Infected Mushrooms. Um, they're kind of an angry band, but I, I loved the image there, so I borrowed it. So let's talk about that, because mushroom poisoning is really becoming much more frequent. Um, as uh, Shane said in my introduction, I've been um, talking about and playing with mushrooms for a long time. Um, and I um, have been working with the poison centers on mushroom uh, identification for about 15 years. Um, trying to get over to the chat box, but I'm not finding it because I don't know if there's any questions. Um, anyway, what I'm seeing over the past five or 10 years is an increase in mushroom poisoning that are driven by this people's interest in mushrooms. Um, so people make assumptions based on inadequate knowledge 
Um, they only know what they know, and sometimes they make mistakes. And so we've seen some pretty significant poisonings, a lot more that are minor. Um, across the country every year, we typically have two or three or four poisoning deaths that we know about. And um, a number of cases where people are sickened to the point where if they didn't get severe, you know, extreme uh, medical care or even uh, liver transplants, they might die. But most of the poisonings are more mild, uh, time limited and gastrointestinal. Um, and not only are people getting sickened, but their dogs are as well. Um, so let's talk, we're gonna focus mostly on mushrooms as food for the rest of this, um, and also talking about the mushrooms that can cause uh, problems. Shane, I'm having trouble. I'm not seeing the chat box anywhere. Okay, Greg, um, there are no questions in the chat box at this time. All right. Well, we would like to encourage you to type your questions to Greg if you have any. Okay, I'll just keep going then. So let's talk about food. Um, you know, most of the time in some of the old, old mushroom guides I, um, I have, we'll talk about the, the food value of, of mushrooms as being negligible, that they're mostly there for flavor and texture. And as we've learned, it is so not the case. Um, particularly if you're, if you're a vegetarian, strict vegetarian, a vegan, mushrooms are an excellent source of non-meat protein. Um, the fleshy mushrooms we eat are anywhere from on the low end 20-25% and on the upper end 45 to almost 50% dry weight protein. And that protein has got a really uh, complementary amino acid um, grouping other than a little low in the, in the sulfur containing ones. Um, they are an excellent ongoing source of vitamin D. In the same way that our bodies make um, cholesterol um, and we need that cholesterol for, for health, um, mushrooms uh, create ergosterol. And ergosterol in the presence of sunlight converts to vitamin D. Um, they're also a good source of vi uh, B vitamins and minerals. They're low in calories, typically high in fiber. Um, they're wicked tasty. And some of them are medicinal and have medicinal value well beyond um, just what um, their eating um, taste is. And I'm gonna do a whole different program on the medicinal value of mushrooms. But let's talk about it, because here we are. We've got the fear of mushrooms, the risk of poisoning, and we have the promise of great food. How do we put it together? Some of the myths we learned, and still I hear out there is, you know, you shouldn't eat, collect and eat mushrooms unless you're an expert, or that you were passed through the hands of an expert. And so that myth that it takes an expert to distinguish an edible mushroom from a toxic mushroom. You know, in some groups of mushrooms, that's true. In fact, this group here, the Ruchulas, there are so many that look similar. There's seven photographs here, and there's at least five different species. They all look pretty similar. Some of them are good edibles, some of them will make you sick. So Ruchulas are definitely a group where you say, wow, I wanna know what I'm doing before I eat them. But there's others um, that are a little bit easier. It's true, you know, some mushrooms can, and they do kill people. Um, but the other truth is there are some common edible mushrooms that are pretty easy to identify and learn. And that's the goal that I would have for anybody learning mushrooms to start with. You begin with a small list of foolproof mushrooms for your area. And I didn't come up with the, the term foolproof mushrooms. I'll give that ben, um, credit to a man named Clyde Christensen, who was a mycologist in the 30s. 40s and 50s. And he wrote a book in 1943, I believe, called Common Edible Mushrooms. And he had this group of four mushrooms he called the Foolproof Four. And he said, you know, these are, should be mushrooms that are common in your area. They're easily identified and they don't have any of those toxic lookalikes. They have a long established edibility history. And so for him, those foolproof mushrooms included the morels, like you see here in the picture, and they included things like the sulfur shelf, which we'll talk more about, or chicken mushroom, and all the white puffballs and the shaggy mane, Caprinus comatus, and I'll show you a picture of that in a second. And Clyde Christensen was in the Midwest, so some of his choice reflects that area. There's a couple I would ease into that, but 
I'm going to urge you to think about developing a foolproof list for New England. So let's talk about some of those from the New England point of view and, um, and what they might be. And the shaggy mane you'll see here is an example of that. It's common. It is really abundant in certain habitats, disturbed ground especially. It's a lovely edible um, with a long history of use. It's the third mushroom I ever ate. I still adore it. And all of the white firm mushrooms, including the, the giant puffball, are great for this area as well. But other than that, we're going to focus on the spring mushrooms. So let's talk about a foolproof list of mushrooms for the spring here. And we're going to talk about the morels, the spring or the uh, aspen oyster mushrooms, the wine caps dropharia, the chicken mushroom or sulfur shelf, and we're going to get into early summer by talking about the black trumpets and the chanterelles. And in a, a survey I did recently, this, this earlier this winter, uh, trying to understand the habits of mushroomers in this region, um, we talked about um, these and, and some of the favorite mushrooms that people had, and I got a uh, Oh, 250 replies included the morels, the black trumpets, the chanterelles, um, and the, the chicken mushroom or sulfur shelf, and the oysters. So they, they've been widely regarded. Let's start out with the morels. So morels are a classic spring mushroom. In fact, looking all across this country, the morels are almost certainly the most commonly collected and eaten wild mushroom in America. They are classic in the spring. They, in this region, they tend to like apple orchards, um, recently dead or dying elm trees, and rich forests with white ash. They also tend to like disturbance. So I've talked to people who said, well, you know, I trimmed a bunch of the brush out of our forest um, last fall. In this spring, I'd never seen them before, but there were the morels. Um, now, I want to tell you that in a lot of parts of Maine, morels are not very common. And many people who collect wild mushrooms will say, I've never seen morel before in, in Maine at all. I used to collect them out west. Um, and there's a couple of caveats. One, a morel that is raw or undercooked is toxic. You will get gastrointestinal problems. And you these can accumulate lead and arsenic. And that's important, particularly if you're someone who collects morels in old apple orchards. And old commercial orchards across uh, America use um, lead arsenate as a, a, as a pesticide for decades. And that tends to accumulate in the soil. So um, if you're collecting them in old apple orchards, just don't eat too many of them. There have been a couple of cases of lead poisoning. So morels uh, come here. The yellow morels tend to appear about the same time as the lilacs are blooming in the apples. That's when they're reaching their peak. Um, they're a gorgeous mushroom. You also find them at times with the, when the violets are out. Um, where I find them most commonly um, is uh, with recently dead elm trees. And we're going through waves where the elms will come back after the Dutch elm disease. They'll get to a certain age and then a bunch of them will die back. And that's when you want to look for them. If there was anybody on, on this uh, program that lived in this area in the 70s, I understand in the late 70s, there used to be huge elm trees lining both sides of Route 1 in Thomaston. And after when they died, there were a lot of morels that were found there. Um, I also find them in some old apple orchards that are dry enough to be grassy, not, when, not the bottomland ones where they're really moist. Um, so we find them about the same time as you find the fiddleheads fruiting. Um, and these are a bunch that I've sliced to clean and get them ready for cooking. And you do want to, uh, to, to slice them. Because as they mature, you know, sow bugs and millipedes and, and uh, slugs like them as well. So if you cut them from stem to stem, you can clean those guys out. And if you're lucky enough to find them, if you find them when they're really immature and young, if you can tolerate it, leave them there. Leave them there and watch them grow. And if you find them and they're about two inches tall, wait another 10 days until they're about four, five, six inches tall and mature. And that's when you harvest them. 
because when they're young, eh, their flavor's not much. When they're mature, their flavor is nirvana. So they do well with a long, slow cook with added flu fluid if they're too dry. I usually use white wine, chicken stock or, or vegetable stock would do as well. Um, I often do a little uh, white wine or a few drops of lemon just to add a little acidity. It sparks their flavor. They, they're great with scrambled eggs or in an omelet like I was create, creating here. If you dry them, they're phenomenal in risottos. I like them braised and roasted. Uh, there's someone on this call tonight who was suggesting stuffing them um, in, with crab and roasting them because that would be a main way. And that would be wonderful, although the, the morel might overwhelm the flavor of the crab, but I'd be willing to try it. It does really well in cream sauces. And there's one I want to tell you about, the false morel, um, Gyromitra esculenta. And in Maine, in most of the parts of Maine, it's much more common than the true morels. It usually starts a little earlier. In fact, I found some, uh, I checked them on Friday and they're getting to be about two inches in diameter. They're starting. And they're my, my harbinger of the morels to come. Um, they're usually associated with pine trees. Um, and the trouble is that they can be highly toxic. They have a toxin in them that converts in our stomachs to a, a complex compound called monomethylhydrazine, which is volatile and carcinogenic and highly toxic. Um, and so there are some people who will cook them very well um, and volatilize off that toxin, but even then it has some of that gyromitrin in it that's a toxin. And when you volatilize it, when you breathe in that, that vapor, it's also uh, caustic and toxic. So why bother? This is a range of this. I took this picture up near Farmington. Um, and you can see the range from pale reddish brown to deep reddish brown across. And that un, un irregular, uneven cap is really classic for this mushroom. So unlike the true morels, which are much more conical, and on the bottom of this slide, the false morels are very much irregular, um, and that brownish red is pretty typical. Um, there is another false morel that is found much more commonly further south in Maine. I find it here occasionally. And I was just thinking in southern Maine, particularly those sandy forests around Massabesic Forest, I'll bet it's pretty common. And this is Gyromitra gigas. And there are people who eat this a lot, um, particularly in the mid-Atlantic, um, but I've also read reports that it has some gyromitrin in it, so be cautious around it. Um, the thing is, in Maine, some of the old traditional people here would eat these false morels. They would call them German browns or lorchel, um, but if you eat too many of them, you get a threshold place, and you go from being fine to being very sick. And people die from eating um, false morels across the world. Be cautious. Here's that same gigas one. And with a false morel, if you slice it in half, you can see the, it's not fully hollow. The, the stem is somewhat stuffed. Um, whereas the true morels, they're completely hollow from top to bottom. Very distinctly different. One's yummy too. So I want to move on to a tiny little mushroom. And I must say that um, my wife, Valley, this is one of her favorite mushrooms. She looks forward to these. I call them a consolation prize while I'm looking for morels. I find them a lot about the time I'm looking for morels. And you'll see them intermittently through the wet periods in the summer. And then you'll see them again in early fall. And they're small, biggest size is about an inch, maybe an inch and a quarter. Um, they're that warm, rosy brown. And the inky caps include a bunch of mushrooms, but I'm going to talk first about this mica cap and then about another one. Now, because they're an LBM, a little brown mushroom, you need to be sure what it is. So they're not quite as foolproof. But once you find them, they're really distinctive. You'll usually find them from buried wood, particularly if there's a place where a tree has been removed. So Sometimes these ones were around the base of, a, of an elm tree, and they're very young, very firm, and that kind of hour frost color that's on the young ones is why they're called the mica cap. And then as they age, you also see, particularly in a wet day, while they're called the glistening um, inky cap. And this is at the base of a maple tree, and these were fruiting about 
a year to two years after it was cut. Here's the, the full uh, maple stump. And so when you find them, you can find a lot of them at once. You want to collect them when they're young before they've really turned black because as they age, you can see the older ones here, they've curled up and their gills are starting to melt away. It's not in any way toxic, but it's a less appealing look in the pan. Because if you get them young and cook them, they look gorgeous, sauteed um, with some butter, a little bit of salt and pepper. You can have them over toast, over a little bit of pasta, or just right out of the pan. Quite tasty. Now, a related um, inky cap is this alcohol inky, or what some people call Tipler's Bane. Uh, and this one is, again, common in the spring and in early, early fall. It's larger, it's more grayish brown, and this is a great edible unless you're drinking a glass of wine with it or after. Um, and then you'll get flushed and sick, your heart will race, um, and it's an anabuse reaction, just like the same anabuse that they will give uh, to treat or to dissuade uh, problem drinkers. So if you find this, um, eat it without alcohol, um, because it's probably not the mushroom that's poisonous. In this case, it's the alcohol that's poisonous. Um, so let's move on. A couple more mushrooms. I want to talk about the Dryad Saddle. Um, I, call, I learned it as Dryad Saddle. Dryad was the queen of the wood nymph, um, and other people learned it as a pheasant back. This is really common in the spring, late spring into June. Um, I find it on elms that I'm looking for uh, morels around. Um, and I also find it a little bit later and then in the fall on maple. It's very distinctive with this very scaly cap and underside is pores, not gills. Um, and it's quite edible when it's young in this stage. So these caps are probably about two to three inches across. You could easily cut them with a knife. And as it gets older, like the, the, the ones on the lower right and the left, they would be tough. Um, and some people still collect and eat them then, or they will use them, slice them up and make a, a like a, a mushroom broth out of them and then throw away the caps. The ones on the top right here in the perfect edible stage. Very common in the Midcoast area. And I'm going to talk about this spring oyster mushroom. I love it. Um, as a May ends and June starts into early July on, an, on a cool year, you can find these mostly on dead aspen poplars, um, on the dead trees or the dead branches of a living tree further up. Um, you'll see them there when they're young, they're pure white, they're clustered, um, they're easily to, to distinguish, they're a great edible with some medicinal value we'll talk about pure white, the underside, you've got the gills that run all the way down to where it attaches to the wood. Um, and they, these ones are probably two to three inches in diameter. When they're more mature, they get five, six, sometimes seven inches. Um, you're going to need to watch them because um, the bugs like them as well. And you want to get ahead of the beetles that are also going to be feeding on them. Um, but collect them um, and saute them up or use them in soups and stews. They're quite tasty. Uh, this is, in, I find, in a, in a dark uh, forest in the understory where it's somewhat gray and cloudy, they will shine out at you. And sometimes you'll find them at head height, sometimes you'll find them 20, 30 feet up. And then you have to use your ingenuity to harvest them. Um, and this photo here is, is more of a midsummer oyster mushroom called pulmonarius, which is also a lovely one. If you're cooking oyster mushrooms, you may want to cut off the tough part of the stem, tear them into pieces, and again, that long, slow stewing uh, cook, uh, which is especially true for the tougher mu oyster mushrooms that are in the fall, which is this is an example. So these are good edibles that are also cultivated, and they're a great um, medicinal mushroom. They have some immune um, boosting kind of anti-tumor uh, glucans that stimulate our immune system. Um, most people who I find use them medicinally use them to address their blood cholesterol. They've got a type of a uh, mevinolin that is similar to a statin that will help address some cholesterol. Now, I'm not saying throw out your statins, you know, talk to your doctor, but if you struggle with high cholesterol, for sure, eat more oyster mushrooms. All right, now, 
as we get in toward June, you're going to start seeing, particularly in paths and anywhere where there's wood mulch, this gorgeous mushroom called the wine cap stropheria. You know, when I first moved here 40 years ago, it was pretty uncommon. I never remember seeing it. But then we started using wood mulch everywhere. We started mulching the trees we cut along the roads, and we started seeing this mushroom much more frequently. It's also very, very easily cultivated. When, you, when it's first opening, you can see it's got these beautiful burgundy caps. In fact, this stage when the, when the caps are still well-rounded is when they're best at eaten. And you can see these are fruiting from wood chips and they're easily cultivated. I'm gonna go back a slide. Um, this is what my yard looks like today. Uh, my neighbor, Terry, he took out a big sugar maple and the upper part of it, they chipped. And I happened to be working from home and I heard the chainsaws and I heard the uh, chipper and I went out and I said, hey, you wanna have a place to dump those chips? So they're at the end of my driveway. And I've made a couple of paths between raised beds. And I'm waiting for the spawn that I ordered from field and forest uh, to come and I'll be inoculating those chips. And so by next spring, maybe even this fall, I'll start to see the mushrooms coming out. As they get older, they start to open up. The caps turn brownish. Um, they're less flavorful and succulent. And when they're, uh, I like them much better when they're younger like this. And when they're fully open, the gills underneath have this kind of grayish to dark grayish color and the spore print is a purple, uh, purplish gray of almost black. Um, very distinctive mushroom. And the other one that comes starting in June is the sulfur shell or chicken mushroom. I find this, there's a flush of them that happen in June, early July. Then in the heat of the summer, they go away and I find them again in the fall, mid fall to almost to November. And the bright color on these is distinctive. Um, they're probably most prevalent on oak, but I find them frequently on ash and they love cherry. I found them out other things as well. So when they first come out of the side of a tree, which may still be still living, they're living on the heartwood, they're these yellow globs that slowly res resolve to an orange upper side and the yellow underneath, and then they turn into these shelves. At this phase, if they're still tender, I'll eat them, but they may start to toughen up. A little bit older, with something like this, you can tell on the edges of this mature one, it's still actively growing. I might cut off the edge, leave the rest there to drop its spores, and just use that for food. So it's a tasty mushroom, um, but it's also a mushroom that must, must, must be cooked before you eat it. And it's a mushroom that some people don't tolerate it well. So I worry it's not, you know, it's not totally foolproof, but it's so distinctive and so widely eaten, um, we keep it in here. And so as we get into the midsummer, and sometimes that starts in June, I want to talk about chanterelles and black trumpets. And for Maine, the chanterelle is the most collected and eaten wild mushroom. And for me, it's a sign that the true summer has begun. If we have a, a good wet June, I begin to see them at the end of mid to end June. And by the second week in August, we can be sure they're around. They're abundant and common across many different kinds of forests. They're a generalist um, and they're loyal and dependable. And what I mean by that is if you find a patch of, of chanterelles, so long as that forest is not disturbed, they're gonna come back there almost every year if there's adequate rain. So you can find them in the same place. They're mild flavored, they're distinctive, and they're just plain yummy. So the golden color, often when you find a, a cluster, you'll find them like this, from the youngest bud on the left there to the more mature one at the top center, all together. Same way here. Um, and if you look underneath, those thick blunted gills that occasionally fork are just very distinct. They never grow in dense clusters. If it's growing in a dense cluster, it's probably a jack-o-lantern. And jack-o-lanterns are toxic. For cooking chanterelles, they, their flavor is, uh, lends itself to fat. So butter, if you're not a uh, someone who eats butter, some kind of mild oil. They do well with uh, sh shallots and leeks, mild onions, love eggs and fish and cream sauces. They're wonderful in a cream sauce over a white fish. 
If you're gonna preserve them, saute and freeze them. Don't dry them, they get too tough. And stay away from this toxic jack-o'-lantern mushroom. Every now and then people mistake it for chanterelles. They're very different. Learn the two of them. And there's some other chanterelles I won't dwell on, but, but recognize they're also good as well. But I wanna finally kind of finish a little bit with the black trumpet, because it is, it is the second most popular edible mushroom in this region. And if more people found it, I have no doubt it would be number one. It's very distinctive, this kind of black, grayish uh, funnel shape. Um, it sometimes hides it itself in, in, uh, in the mulch, which I'll show you in a second. But if you find it fruiting on um, moss, it's very distinctive, easily seen. There's no toxic lookalikes at all. If it's in, in, in the leaf mulch, it's harder to see. But if you see one, stop and look around. There's probably 25 black trumpets in this photograph. And it'd take you a while to see them, and we're not gonna spend that much time here. But if you find them on moss, boy, they just leap out at you. The flavor is incredible. Very robust and yet tender. Um, you can use them almost any way you'd use a mushroom. Eggs, chicken, meat, red sauces, cream sauces, um, eggs. I love them on top of a pizza or forcaccia. If you get a bunch of them, which you will in an abundant year, dry as many as you can for the future. Because on average, about every four years, we have a good year. All right, so let's see. What time is it getting to be, Sean? It's a little after seven. We can go to questions now, or I can spend about five minutes on some guidelines for new mushrooms. Um, there are a couple of questions that have come through, Greg. Um, do you want to take them now? Sure, th throw them out to me. Okay. Me um, one person has asked, why are the names of mushrooms constantly changing? <laughs> well, you know, that's Good happening question. in almost every field. Particularly, you know, as we learn more, the tech um, are changing things as I understand more, um, it bedevils me. Um, it's crazy making at times. So if they have a good common name, I'll use it. But the scientific names are important, particularly on the more obscure mushrooms. Excellent. Um, these might be topics for future talks. Somebody wants to know if you'll be covering poisonous, mus poisonous mushrooms even more at some point. Yes, in about two weeks, uh, with the partnering, cover your ears, Sean, with the Bangor Public Library, I'll be doing another one of these focused solely on poison mushrooms and, and how to avoid them. Excellent. And then on the, along the same line, someone would like to know if you will be covering areas where each mushroom are most commonly found or <laughs> habitat. We, you mean like a habitat? If you, you know, I do, and, and we can go on to that. I'll go first there. Um, if you, oops, I went the wrong way. I'm sorry. I'll, I teach some day long workshops on mushroom identification, and that's where you'd get that kind of tips. It's, it's too fast in this kind of uh, presentation. Let's see if we go through. But I'll be offering a number of those this summer, this summer and if you send me an email, um, you can get on my list uh, of, of those. So mushroomatmidcoast.com. Um, I have a number of those scheduled and we'll see whether social distancing will allow them to happen. Um, Excellent. I, al I also do a five day um, class with a good friend of mine up at Eagle Hill in Washington County. We'll be doing that at the end of July. Um, and that's a time to learn a ton about mushroom identification. Another question Greg, is, um, can you over harvest mushrooms? Should you only harvest a certain number in one area? That is an excellent question. There's some mushrooms I really worry about that, particularly the medicinal mushroom chaga, because it's slow to come back. Other mushrooms, um, I always urge you to take the prime ones, leave the youngest and leave the oldest. Um, but also recognize that the mushroom fruiting body is just the fruiting body. So the vegetative part of the mushroom is still under the ground or in the log, and your picking it is not affecting future mushrooming. 
so long as you haven't disturbed the log or disturbed the, the forest stumps. There have been some long-term studies with chanterelles in that respect, um, showing that harvesting does not impact it. Trampling the forest, cutting trees, those kinds of things significantly will impact for future fruitings. But be, uh, be generous and leave mushrooms for both the animals and other people. We have a question. Are there any edible mushrooms that grow on softwood trees? Um, yes, um, but fewer. And I'm not going to, I'm not going to, since I don't have photographs and times to describe them, I'm, I'm not going to really kind of dive into them. There are some, yeah. Sure. Okay, let's go to a question. Um, Greg, can you direct them to a good online source that they can use to compare mushrooms before eating them? Um, there are a couple of really, in terms of resources, there's a few that I'm, I'm going to recommend. Um, these days, you know, everybody still, 96% you know, of people in the survey still are using field guides, and there's some good ones out there. Um, I can also recommend, in terms of mushrooming sites, there is a Facebook group on Maine mushroom hunting that is pretty popular. Um, make sure that, you know, who's commenting on your, on your sites is, is good. There's a couple really excellent websites. One of them is called mushroomexpert.com. Um, they do a really good job of descriptions and photographs. He doesn't talk about edibility or toxicity. That's, you know, his bottom line. And there's one that I use every week, um, even through the winter, and they have a good app, but the challenge is it's in French. And if you Google Myco Quebec, um, they have a phenomenal website um, with a really deep list of mushrooms. Um, and my, my French is horrible, but I find it incredibly useful. These have been some great questions. I think I have got to most of the ones from the chat box. All right. And please um, write a question if you have one we haven't gotten to yet. All right, a couple other things. I want to acknowledge that my book, Chantrell Dreams, is still um, in print and available. Um, and it covers the foolproof four and how to really kind of find them. And it adds a few others to it. And has some great stories about mycophobia and mycophilia. Um, and my Mushrooms for Health book is still available on Kindle. Unfortunately, it is currently out of print. Um, so I want to kind of give people time to ask questions. Um, again, acknowledging uh, Maine Mycological Association as a, a co-sponsor of this and a place where if you want to learn mushrooms, join them. It ta costs all of about 12 bucks a year. Um, and we sponsor about 12 kind of weekend forays in different parts of the state, which is a bunch of people getting together to collect mushrooms in an area and to talk about what's there. It's a great way to learn with other people who love mushrooms. Excellent. Um, and if you just put in a search engine for the Maine Mycological Association, you'll come up with their website. So if people can raise their hands if you want to call on them. This is my final slide, and I want to give Rumi some, some room here. So let the beauty you um, love be what you do. So there's a thousand ways to kneel and kiss the earth. And for me, mushrooming is chief among them. So happy to take other, mush other questions from folks. Greg, Greg. Tina's iPhone is Tina. Tina's iPhone is raising her hand. I can see um, if Tina's iPhone. She has a question, and I'll see if I can unmute her. Maybe Great. does that sound good? Yeah. Let's see if I can easily do that. She's raising her hand. Um, so Tina, you're unmuted now. If you want to ask a question. Okay, my question, I had asked it earlier when you were talking about the morels. <clears throat> I, I had a flush that used to come up in my backyard, and I used to get like 40 or 50 morels, which was shocking in my area. And as the years went by, the, the flush got less and less, and now they don't come up at all anymore. What would cause this to happen? So, Tina, were they in wood chips? 
No, they were not. They were on the grass. In the okay. grass. Were we were back in had you removed or had there been an elm that died or an apple tree that died and was removed? Not at all. No. Nope. Yeah. And I don't know. There. And we did, at, we did when I first moved here, we had a burn pile. We burned. Um, and it might have been that next year that they started coming up, but then they just got less and less as the years went on and then nothing. I was so sad. <laughs> well, um, you probably hit on it right there because morels benefit from sweeter soil. And one way to sweeten soil is to burn. Um, and uh, actually, if you burn a forest, it'll often trigger flushes of morels, but they won't last forever. Good Read question. That. If I start another burn pile or keep doing them, would they come yeah. back? Give it a try. Wish Can't hurt. Wishful thinking, huh? Thank yeah. you very much. I appreciate it. And, oh, so and Devin Kane has a question, and I'm going to unmute Devin. Excellent. Hi. Devin, you're unmuted. My question was, would you recommend eating coral mushrooms? I've heard some conflicting things about it, and I was curious as to what your take was on that. My take on them is to be really careful. There's a couple of species of coral that are very easy to identify and good edibles like the uh, crested coral and um, the crown coral. Uh, anything in the Romaria genus, I would stay away from because it's really, really difficult to identify them to species, and some of them are pretty nasty um, GI irritants. Oh, thank you. Yeah, we have a lot of them on the property, so we were just curious. We were IDing them, but definitely heard conflicting on each side. Yeah. All right. And Barbara Anderson has a question, and I'll unmute her. Hey, Barbara. I'm so glad to, to be able to follow this. And I'm impressed that according to my phone, you have 143 people following with me and good on you. I really enjoyed it. And I, I'm going to try to catch up with you more and maybe go to one of your classes. Good. But I don't know enough to ask any questions All unless right. I get you over here to identify mushrooms. Ah. This was COVID desperation. What do we do on a lovely evening when it's going to rain? Greg, we have a, thank you so much, Barbara. We have a few more questions from the chat box. Um, one is, I was going on mushroom hunting adventures with my grandparents and was taught to never pull the mushroom out of the ground, but rather to cut them. What is your take on this? That's a, you know, that's a complex thing. Um, and you know, the, one of the studies of chanterelles to, to study fruiting, they had a, a chunk of forest that they sectioned off into three areas. And in one of them, there was a control. They didn't touch any of the chanterelles. In one of them, they cut them at ground level to harvest them. And in one of them, they plucked them. And then they compared over like 15, 20 years what the refruiting was like. And where they plucked them, they found that the fruiting increased slightly. And where they cut them, the fruiting decreased slightly. But it wasn't significant either way. And if you think about it, if you cut them and you leave that stub in the ground that's 85% moisture and 20% protein, it's, it could, might be a way for mold or bacteria to get down in the mycelium. That's the only thing I can think of. Um, but certainly before you get them in your basket, you want to cut off that base so you don't get dirt in your basket. Uh, two more questions from the chat box. If everyone mushrooms, is there a risk that mushrooms will become over harvested? Ooh. In areas that are heavily traveled, potentially. Um, in parts of Europe, uh, they started worrying about that. Um, and that's why they started doing these studies around chanterelles, because harvesting is such a passionate thing. Um, and their chanterelle harvests were going down. And what they found, it was more because of runoff of fertilizers from agricultural areas and from acid rain. That was impacting the harvest much more than, than collecting. But again, there's always that worry. And for things like chaga, yeah, we can certainly over harvest it. So tread lightly, collect only what you know you're gonna use. 
Um, can you talk about post rain mushroom hunting schedule and how <clears throat> that affects your plans or if you pay attention to ground temperature? Um, ground temperature, somewhat um, for some species uh, and more it's air temperature, but I definitely, so for instance, morels. I'm not gonna start looking for the true morels to begin fruiting until we have some days that get into up into the upper 50s, which is gonna begin this weekend uh, along the coast. Um, and in terms of rainfall, there's a kind of a truism. An inch of rain and 10 days will elicit the maximum benefit from that rain. So if it's two inches of rain, you can get more, but it takes a while for that to be triggered. And it would be longer than 10 days if that inch or two inches of rain came after a long dry period versus if things have been moderately rainy before then. So I pay attention to that deeply. Um, another question in the chat box. You mentioned elm trees quite a bit. Is there a better area for elm trees in Maine? <clears throat> hmm. What I would do is I would get in my car, escape the COVID isolation, go through areas of farming and kind of edges of towns. That's where the elms tend to be heaviest. And train your eye to recognize an elm tree from a quarter mile away. They're very distinctive shape, very distinctive shape. <clears throat> uh, many thank yous are coming through, Greg, for the talk. And another question, I used to find boulets under my white pine trees. Now I cannot. Any reason? Maybe the season? Thank you for your talk. Um, so depends on the species, and certainly there is a seasonality to them. I know that if, if we're talking over 20, 30, 40 years they've been collecting them, that as a forest matures, the types of mushrooms that it will generate uh, in that mycorrhizal asso association will change. Um, so that may be it, but there's not enough information to be answering deeply about that. And we have tried to get to all of your questions. Thank you for your patience. It looks like we are at the last question in the chat box. Are chicken of the woods poisonous, poisonous if growing on a certain tree? Yeah, well, see, when you talk about, when you call it a chicken of the woods, we're not talking species. There are, that's a, the, the genus is Ladiaporus, and there's a couple of different species. We have one here that's Ladiaporus heronensis that grows on conifers, and that one will sicken. So I more focus on, you know, if it, is it growing on a hardwood um, rather than a conifer? And occasionally I find um, chicken mushrooms growing on um, uh, locust. And I wouldn't trust it them on locusts because they say they found in the West Coast, they found if they're fruiting on eucalyptus, they will sicken people. So collect them off cherry, collect them off ash, collect them off oak and enjoy them. I think we have got through all the questions here. Well, I want to thank the uh, library for hosting this um, and for the 180 people, I believe, who came, which was oh, cool. quite, quite fun. Um, and I really look forward to the, if the library is able to post this, uh, the recording of it. Um, and let's look forward to a season when we can learn mushrooming and do a whole lot more of it. And in two weeks uh, at the Bangor Library on toxicity. Thank, thank you so much, Greg. Thank you so much. And thank you all of you for coming out to attend this talk. We hope you will um, attend future virtual talks. And we will plan to see you at Trivia next Tuesday. And remember that we will be hosting New Shades of Blue for a concert on Thursday, May 21st. We'll keep you posted on how to get the Zoom links for those events. Thank you. Everybody take good care and have a wonderful evening. Thank you.